And so what does that mean? We're looking at the minor prophets. They get some short shrift in sermons, and uh, I'm no exception to that rule. I've kind of done the same thing. But there's a lot that can be learned. Uh, we, we certainly learn you know, practical lessons for sure. There's ample things that we can draw and look at ourselves as we study these minor prophets. But uh, we learn biblical history, which is important. We, uh, we're learning God's word, and that's an important thing, too. It's God's word, so it all has value, even if we don't think it's particularly pertinent to what's going on. But it is pertinent to what's going on. And why is that? Because these minor prophets have a lot of prophecy. <laughs> Prophets, prophecy, get it? Okay. But I mean, so not only short term, but also end time stuff. So the minor prophets are important. So just a quick review of last week. You had the, the, the Jews from Judah who were, you know, uh, taken over by Babylon, exiled to Babylon. And um, Daniel was such a big help in working with Nebuchadnezzar and everything and interpreting his dreams and so forth that they were well prepared for what was going on. So Daniel was well loved, um, hated too. But then uh, Cyrus told the Jews, go back, to, go back to your land, go back to Judah, start rebuilding your temple or whatever. But actually a minority of Jews went back. Most of them stayed in Babylon where they were. So they get back, they start to rebuild the temple. The Gentiles that are in the area put up a stink. They put a, a prohibition on rebuilding the temple. So it sits idle for 15 years, the work that's being done. Then this guy Darius comes in. He tells him, hey, rebuild your temple. It's cool. We got, you know, there's no restrictions anymore. But by then they kind of lost their zeal. They weren't really into it anymore. They had sort of gotten used to not having it. And they even took some of the materials that were supposed to be used for the temple and they started to build houses of their own with that. And so that's kind of where we come into the story uh, in, in the book of Haggai. Or is it Haggai? I don't know. Haggai? Okay. So, um, and we talked about last week how God was telling them, hey, wh what are you doing? Consider your ways. That was one of the big themes from last week's message. Consider your ways. God is telling the Jews, as he's telling all of us as individuals and as a church, consider your ways. Think about who you are. Think about who you are in me. Think about what I've done. Think about where you could have been. Bless you. And, and not quit busying yourself with your own houses at the expense of my house. And, of course, God was talking about the temple, but... We have to understand that has a, a broader application, you know, because we can busy ourselves with our own stuff, you know, whether it's, you know, our job, even things that aren't necessarily sinful, but we get so consumed by hobbies or so consumed by problems or work or whatever that we, we, we tend to uh, push God out. So uh, we don't want God's house or God's business to be pushed off to the side while we busy ourselves with our own things. Uh, that's not the point of all this. So that's kind of where we are, but, but, but the Lord comes back. He gives great strength to uh, Joshua, who's like the religious leader, and also Zerubbabel, who's the civic leader, and the Jews themselves. He inspires them, get back to work, rebuild that temple. That's what your job is. And so they begin to do it. And so that's where we pick up Haggai chapter 2. In the seventh month, on the 21st day of the month, the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Speak now to Zerubbabel, the son of Shelatiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and to all the remnant of the people, and say, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? So there's three questions. You got basically what was going on, especially if you read some of the other books. We on? It's rubbing up against my shirt. How's that? Is that any better? Okay. <laughs> We're airing our technical difficulties for the whole world to see. The whole world is watching this sermon. Amen. <laughs> and... Uh, where, where was I? Where, what, what day is this? Sunday? Okay. Oh, three questions. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's quite an echo going on now, you know. There's quite an echo. Huh? Oh, he, yeah, I know he will. I know he will. 
But um, so there's three questions. You got basically you had some of the older people who were starting to grumble. It's like, you know, hey, look at this temple that we're rebuilding. Look at it. It's not what the old one was. It's not what the Solomon's temple was. This is kind of inferior. And so they're dragging down the younger people who started the work as the older folks were kind of trying to recall the glory days. They were looking back. Remember the good old days with that other temple? And so God asked three questions of them. He says, uh, you know, what do you think about this house now? I mean, do you think it's nothing? Does it have the former glory that it used to? And remember, from God's perspective, he is looking at his temple as his temple in a singular, singular unit, whether it was Solomon's temple, whether it's this temple or the millennial temple, it's all God's house. It may have different stages. It may have different looks. But in God's eyes, it is one temple. And so he's asking these folks, uh, what's on your mind with this? What are you thinking? And, Lord, and folks, it really hit me as I was, as I was preparing for this that we can ask those questions of, of this church, of our country, of our lives. You know? Uh, you know, this, uh, then I, there's, I don't know, there's still, there's still people here who were here back in the old days of this church. You know, when, you know, you didn't have Randy over here every day trying to make sure the heat's going or, you know, trying to do things and, and getting five million fans to try to cool the place off. Um, you had 250 people in here back in the 60s and 70s and maybe the 80s, whatever. And uh, there used to be nominating committees to get people to nominate other people for other stuff. I mean, it was... But actually, that, that was to me insane, but, you know, that's, uh, but anyway, you know, I guess people could look back, well, I remember the good old days, and the building wasn't falling apart, when we didn't have all these issues and everything else. I don't know that anybody even says that, but it certainly could happen. But what you have to understand, folks, is that it's just as with this temple that God is talking about. The building is the building. It's important, but it's the spirit of what goes on here that's important. And that ministry, that, that wanting to, to grow and wanting to get the proper message, the true sound doctrine of the Bible out to people, that hasn't changed. So whether we're in this building or if in a few months down the road or whatever, we're in a smaller building, it's still Elam. It's still these folks here. It's still all of you. And, um, and so that's what God is trying to, to, to get at, uh, is that, you know, look, this house here that you're building, is it as good as the other one? Is it as ornate and beautiful and magnificent? Well, maybe not in look, but in my purposes for what I have planned, God says, it's exactly what it needs to be. And, you know, I think of the country in the same way. You know, we, we, we talk about our country, and, and I, I do the same thing. I use the same language. What's happening to it? And it, it, we know it's going in the wrong way. We know it's not a matter of, uh, you know, just disagreeing about political things. We see people in positions of power exercising evil things. I just gave you an example of the banks and, uh, and things of that nature. Uh, we see people, you know, pushing abortion, pushing sexual immorality, pushing the, the, the uh, you know, the, the butchering of children with this, you know, this, this, you know, sexual reassignment stuff and all that. So as Janet said a little while ago, we're in a war. You know, it's not a matter of, you know, well, don't talk about politics in church. I'm not talking about politics. I'm not talking about taxes or, you know, or, or national defense or anything like that. We're talking about good and evil. You know, so that's, that's what we're getting at. And, uh, and yet the country itself, what this country is built on, hasn't changed. There's still good there. But what's done with it, the people who are abusing it, that's what you need to look at. That's why I never could understand, and I'm probably breaking all the rules of uh, genteel preaching now uh, because I'm kind of going off topic a little bit. But it just, when I, when I study and I prepare for a message, certain things jump out at me that I just, I just feel the need to, to share. But... Um, 
you know, you had uh, your Megan Rapinoe's and all these people who turn their back on the flag and, and they take a knee and they won't acknowledge it. And I, I always thought how absolutely illogical and stupid that is. And why? Because the things the country was built on are still there. You have the right to go out and make a lot of money playing a sport. You have that right here. You have the right to say, hey, I don't like what's going on. I think it's wrong. You have the right to try to do something to make a change, to spend money, to create think tanks, ads. You run for office. You support candidates who think like you do. And the flag is the symbol of your ability to do that. So to thumb your nose at that symbol is ludicrous. It's illogical. It's unreasonable. But we have to kind of think of the same thing. The country itself is, is still, the, the, the basis of it is still good. It's being overwhelmed right now by these evil tendencies. Uh, but we have to recognize that just because things aren't like they were in the good old days doesn't mean it's the end of the line or that we should give up. Was this temple that God was talking about here, that, that he's telling the Jews to rebuild, is it going to be the same magnificent temple that, 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 that when Solomon built it? No, it's not, not at least in its physical appearance. But God is telling them, I've got this here for a reason right now. You do what I say, rebuild the temple. But folks, think about ourselves. We think about ourselves as individuals. You know, you know I'd, I'd love to go out there and play football right now. I would love to, to, you know, just be able to do what I used to do in the past, just tear down the field, making cuts, being open, leaping up for it. I, I, I miss it. I love it. I can still catch the ball, but I don't think I could run very fast or very far. So those days are probably gone, right? But do you lament and say, oh, look at my life back then. Look what I could do. I can't do it anymore. You can do that or you can say, look, <laughs> the real me, the real you is in here. That's what God is looking at. That's what he treasures. And so this outer shell may not be as magnificent as it once was. But God's got us here for a reason at this time. And we are headed for future glory. Not because we're just hope, wishing and hoping, oh, I hope it turns out right. No, it's because God has guaranteed it. So when we look at this passage, we can apply it in so many different ways. The temple, our church building, our country, ourselves. Leave it in God's hands. Trust him, and I'm telling you, it makes a lot of things better. I'm not saying it makes all the problems go away, but you have the strength to endure. Verse 4, and I love this too, because it reminded me of all the places in Scripture, and I, I was going to read some of them, but it, it, it's manifest throughout Scripture. Yet now, be strong. That's a command. Be strong. O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord, be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts, according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. So all these things were throughout so many passages of Scripture, Old and New Testament, God is telling us, be strong, fear not. But what is the, always the added rejoinder to that? For I am with you. For I am with you. You, got no, you have nothing to fear. Be strong. It's a command. And, and, I, and I tell you, that has helped me so much when I start, you know, things go on and, and that, that worry starts to set in. It's like, no, stop for a minute. Be strong. Be courageous in the face of whatever it is. Trust in God. He is with us. The problems that we have, I'm not, you know, I think of this little girl, this young girl, Natalie, that's a heartbreak. But we've got to be strong. We've got to be strong for her, strong for the family, to pray for them and know that this pain, whatever it is, is but for a moment when we compare it to eternity. 
And so I, I love these passages of Scripture where God is looking at us and I guess in a way giving us the respect of being able to answer his call to be strong. Be strong. Verse 6, For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations so that the treasure of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. That verse 8 and 9, are well, verse 9 is just so rich, so rich. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former. So, and in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Once again, if you think about it, God is looking at it full spectrum. How can somebody look at this temple as it is right now and think that it's going to be more glorious than Solomon's temple? But here's how. First of all, the Bible has a lot of short-term biblical prophecies that are fulfilled. Okay, the, the, the one example I can think of is in Daniel chapter 9, which we were talking about in our Bible study uh, last week. But Daniel chapter 9, Daniel talks about this abomination of desolation that's going to take place. And but you must look at Scripture and take the whole thing into account. That's why we bounce around and we study other books. What does the whole Bible say about the end times, about the tribulation period? And when you listen to Jesus himself in that Olivet Discourse, Everything is full circle there. It is something that has never happened and is yet future. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that there was a short-term fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy, and it happened with Antiochus Epiphanes. This was a guy, this was um, an offshoot of the Greek Empire, and uh, I think I mentioned this, you know, recently, but he... He, you know, uh, slaughtered a pig in, on the brazen altar and erected an idol of Zeus in the Holy of Holies. It was an in-your-face to God. And uh, so Daniel prophesied that. Daniel, his view was something much later down the line, but there was a short-term fulfillment. The primary fulfillment of that will occur in the Great Tribulation, where you have uh, what Jesus said, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. So Jesus is here in history. He's looking back to something Daniel said that's going to happen in the future. And so uh, there was a short-term fulfillment with Antiochus, but it was not the primary fulfillment. And the primary fulfillment is always what we need to be completely focused on, especially in light of all the other pieces of the puzzle that, that, that fit together with that. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. So there's a short-term fulfillment, and that was when Herod refurbished this particular temple that they're going to finish doing. It's going to look a lot better. It's going to be a lot closer to Solomon's temple. It's going to be great. It's going to surpass the temple that they're currently building, but what's the peace that will be brought into that temple? Jesus Christ. Jesus will be in that temple. He will be the, uh, I guess, the intermediary Shekinah glory, if you will. But the long-term fulfillment is just that. It is that in the latter, you know, at the end of the, the tribulation, and then you go on into the millennium, that temple will be built by Christ himself so, and the Shekinah glory will return as it was many centuries before. So there was a short-term fulfillment, but the ultimate primary fulfillment will be Jesus rebuilding this temple and uh, the Shekinah glory returning. Verse 10, on the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, 
Ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with the dead body touches any of these things, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. So the point here is, is that holiness isn't contagious. You can't catch my salvation. What's the matter? What's happened to you? I got too close to Dave today and I got saved. You know, I think I'm coming down with salvation. Doesn't quite work that way. So just because you're born into a Christian home or you think you live in a Christian nation or whatever doesn't make you a believer. Okay, on the other hand, sin is contagious. The defilement that I put out there as an advertisement for something, um, you know, uh, whatever that may be. You know, when people are, are encouraging you to, to engage in sin or encouraging you to do sinful things, uh, that starts to spread, that gets contagious, and it begins to, you know, wear down everything. But it's much the same way as, it, you know, if you, you know, the, you look at the cross and it's a symbol of holiness, right? Because it's a symbol of what Jesus did. Well, does that mean that if somebody just wears a cross around their neck, that, hey, they're covered because they've, they've got the shield of holiness? No, because their heart is not, it's, it's, their heart is not with Christ. They're not really believers. It's a, it's a, it's a sham. Uh, and so that's the point of all this, is that... Um, Holiness is not contagious, but sin is. Then Haggai answered and said, So it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so with every work of their hands. And what they offer there is unclean. So this is what's going on. When the Jews had, you know, kind of resisted and became idle, and, uh, and weren't doing what they were supposed to be doing. The direct result of the punishments they received were elucidated in Numbers and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. They were still reaping the consequences of that even after they started listening to God and rebuilding the temple. The harvest that they brought in was poor. Uh, you, I think you find that out in Ezra. And so I think they're wondering, well, what's going on? Lord, we're following you now, and now we're not getting the blessing. But, but God tells them, hey, this is still an after effect of what you did before. But here's always the good news, folks. Here's always the good news. Verse 15, now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vat to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you all and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail, yet you did not turn to me declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate, and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But then listen to what the Lord says. But from this day on, I will bless you. From this day on, I will bless you. The Lord is telling them what the problem is. He's telling them why it happened. He's telling them what it must done, be done to be fixed, and he offers the blessing. And Fruchtenbaum said that the people, they started to rebuild the temple, not because they're going, hey, let's get a blessing. No, they rebuilt the temple to be loyal and obedient to God, and then God blessed them. And that's where I want to, you know, there's this beautiful dynamic that we have with our salvation, and it's this. First of all, the, the law demands righteousness that we can't fulfill. So it's like, well, how, how am I going to be perfect and go to heaven? I can't be perfect. That's already, that was out the door a long time ago. Right? Um, yet we belong to Christ. Jesus fulfills the law and the prophets. He does perfect everything, and we belong to him, so we wear his righteousness. So 
uh, we can't save ourselves, but we are saved because of the perfection of Jesus Christ. He took our sin debt at the cross, gave us his righteousness when we believe. But then as we go along in our Christian life, do we say, hey, um, you know, I think I can coast now. I'm saved. I know I can't lose my salvation, so I think I'll just, uh, you know, kick back. You know, Lord's going to save me no matter what I do. I'm good. Do we take that attitude? No. I, I don't know that anybody really does, but the, that's the point, though. Uh, just, just real quick, uh, back in uh, the year 2000, I had been at um, a transportation company for about four years, and I decided to... Uh, to, to get out of that one and, and go to a different company. And um, my buddy Wes said, once you get one year under your belt in this industry, you'll always have a job. And he was right because I, I, I was leaving that company. I had three offers on the table, you know, from three, three different trucking companies. And it wasn't because, oh, I was such a great salesman. It's just they needed people with experience, bottom line. You know, it didn't matter. They didn't really look at and see how successful you'd been. But, one of the companies that I turned down was FedEx. And the other company I went to, it just didn't work out. I was there eight months and I, I was out of there. Well, FedEx had another opening. So I called them back. They brought me in and they hired me. And they didn't have to. Yeah, they could have taken the attitude, hey man, you know, you had your chance eight months ago and you blew it, so you know, better luck next time. But I remember with the regional VP of sales, he, he sent an email to me, he said, Dave, welcome aboard, and uh, I'm glad you're here. We had to go after you twice, he said. You know, just kidding, just as a kind of a welcoming, you know, thing. But I thought to myself then, uh, and this is no brag on me, I'm just, this is just a, one of those moments in life where you kind of make a good decision. I said, because I've made plenty of bad ones, but this was a good one. Uh, where I said, you know, they didn't have to do this. They did not have to hire me. And they did. And he was so cool about it. I'm going to work extra hard now. I'm going to work extra hard because I want to show them, you made the right decision in giving me a second chance. And I've taken that with me and it served me well. And I look at that in terms of our salvation. God didn't have to save us. He didn't have to send Jesus to endure all that pain and and misery on the cross. He didn't have to, but he did. So when we do what's right in our sanctification process after we're saved, we're doing it out of gratitude for what God has done for us, for what Jesus has done for us. It is gratitude for the grace that he's given us. So we are obedient and we work and we serve. But here's the thing. The whole while we know that if we do stumble or we do fall, God is there to pick us up. Amen. You know, it's, it's not that we go into it going, hey, God's going to pick us up if I fall. So, hey, you know, let's go uh, into that strip club over there. No problem. See, we don't do it that way. That's backwards. On the front end, we say, Lord, you save me. I want to live for you. I want to be obedient. But when we do stumble, we'll be forgiven. So that's the attitude, and that's what's going on here, is that they, they, were not, they were doing it out of obedience and gratitude to the Lord, not because they were trying to get a blessing. They were kind of wondering what was going on, though, when the harvest was so poor. It was a legitimate question, and God answered them. And he said, this is what the deal is. All right, let's, let's finish it, and we'll, then we'll have communion. Uh, verse 20, the word of the Lord came to, uh, a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am about to shake the heavens and the earth and to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I am about to destroy the strength of kingdoms of the nations and overthrow the chariots and their riders. Now, remember we talked about how you know, Haggai is a prophet, how these minor prophets... They still have a lot to say. This is so subtle, but it is beautiful because he's talking about the tribulation. And get what he says here. And this is why, you know, uh, that's why some of the translations I, I don't like because the, the Hebrew word is kise, and it means it's a masculine, I just looked this up. I mean, I'm no Hebrew scholar, but it's a singular masculine noun and kise. And so, 
I am about to overthrow the throne of kingdoms. Isn't that interesting? Not the thrones of kingdoms, the throne of kingdoms. He's talking about the Antichrist. The throne, it's a singular throne where the Antichrist rules all these nations. And it's a subtle thing. Some of the, you know, some of the, the translations say the strength of, or it's, it's a mistranslation. And so uh, that word, the throne of kingdoms, is, I just, I was blown away by that because it's such a subtle thing. You know, people, there's thrones of kingdoms, but not with the Antichrist. He's got his own throne and he rules over all the kingdoms. And so God says, I'm going to destroy that. It's a little subtle thing, but it's still beautiful prophecy. And we know what's going to happen in those end times when, you know, God is going to deal with these nations. He's going to shake the nations. He's going to shake the heavens. Uh, you know, the temple in the millennium is going to be rebuilt and, and so on and so forth. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, O Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Sheotiel, declares the Lord, and make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. And so uh, Zerubbabel is going to be in some sort of authority, like a prince of some kind uh, during the millennium in Israel. So that, uh, that wraps up the book of Haggai. But you see, folks, all these lessons that can be learned with God working with the Jewish people here. And that, you know, trusting in him, being strong, um, understanding that our faith and our intentions toward God precede everything else. And so it all falls into place, serving the Lord and pleasing him. But at the same time, if we stumble, we don't, we don't go into things knowing, hey, uh, I'm going to stumble, so I'm not going to try. We try, but we also have that safety net of knowing God's got me covered. He is my advocate. He is my savior. And he's, he's faithful and just to forgive me when I do fall. And so the temple does get rebuilt. And then, you know, the history continues on from there. But I love this little book, two chapters. And I think it had just an absolute ton of, of, of great things in it that we can learn practically and also learn for down the road. Amen. Okay, let's stand. Uh, Tom, can you help Randy today?